Hello, you're listening to Health Affairs This Week, the podcast where health affairs editors get together at the virtual water cooler to talk about the latest news in health policy. I'm Rob Lott. This is week three of a five-part mini-series on the podcast where we're taking a break from the headlines and digging in a little deeper on the topic of housing and health. Our goal is to elevate some of the content from our archives, namely half a dozen health policy briefs on the topic, and to set the stage for our upcoming theme issue scheduled to go live in early February. And so we're doing our part here by talking to those experts who have helped us develop those briefs over the years. Our guest today is Dr. Ingrid Ellen, the Paulette Goddard Professor of Urban Policy and Planning and uh, Faculty Director at the NYU Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy. Her research centers on housing and urban policy with a focus on neighborhoods and racial segregation. She's also the author of our health policy brief on gentrification and the health of neighborhoods' legacy residents. And perhaps most importantly, most recently, um, she has been the outside editorial advisor for our upcoming theme issue. Together with Dr. Mariana Arcaya, the two of them have worked closely with Health Affairs editors to help shape and guide the issue and its content as it's been developed over the last year. I was delighted to talk to Dr. Ellen, and I'm delighted to share that conversation with you here now. So, Ingrid Ellen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Happy to be here. When we talk about housing mobility, I think a lot of people first think of vouchers, which are essentially a way uh, for policymakers to help people afford housing. But not only that, it's also, in theory, a mechanism that might allow people to move from one neighborhood or town to another. I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about how those two goals, affordability and the location of the housing, how those two goals became entwined. Sure. I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm going to take a step back sort of historically and just say that Congress created the first version of the voucher program in 1974. And at that point, the federal government had only subsidized buildings, right, like public housing developments. And and in the 1970s, there were a number of concerns about those buildings really coming from both sides of the aisle, um, uh, and including that subsidized developments, including public housing, stigmatized um, tenants and isolated them from their neighbors. And it, it didn't help that that for political reasons, the developments tended to be located in high poverty neighborhoods, um, often neighborhoods that were disproportionately black. And, and, and the voucher emerged basically out of that environment. Um, and, and to be clear, right, unlike place-based subsidies, a voucher is portable, right? It goes directly to the renter, right? And, and then renters can use those vouchers to rent homes on the private market And they typically pay just 30% of their income towards rent. And a local housing agency pays the balance of the rent up to a local payment standard. And and, and one of the key motivations for this program, for the voucher program, was really to give households more choice, right? More flexibility to choose the home that they wanted to live in, more flexibility to choose the neighborhood they wanted to live in. And and the hope was that the program would be both um, lower cost and it would both reduce, and let me say that the, that the hope was that the program would both reduce the cost of of housing for low income families and open up affordable homes in a broader diversity of, of neighborhoods. It's now been almost fifty years since the since vouchers were created. Yeah, we're going to have to have some anniversaries coming up. All uh, right, <laughs> what have we learned? What are we going to celebrate during during those anniversaries? Yeah, there's there is there is uh, lots to celebrate. I mean, I think there is there is very strong experimental evidence that vouchers um, provide do a lot of good for the families who who, who successfully use them. Uh, there's strong evidence that vouchers reduce rent burdens, they improve affordability, that they decrease household crowding, and they lower the risk of homelessness as well. Um, There's also evidence that vouchers improve long-term outcomes more than um, public housing or more than, uh, at least more than distressed public housing. Um, The Moving to Opportunity Program, or or what's often called the MTO demonstration, 
um, randomly assigned families living in public housing, uh, in high poverty public housing developments to receive an unrestricted voucher on the one hand, that was A, right? B, they received a housing voucher that they could use in, that they had to use in low poverty neighborhoods, or C, they remained in public housing. Researchers uh, found that the, the young children whose families received just the unrestricted vouchers through the experiment saw a, a 15% boost to earnings through um, in, in, by their mid-20s. So because this is a health affairs podcast, I want to ask about uh, specifically about the impact on people's health and well-being. Um, I guess one question for you, what is the theory about how uh, housing mobility programs and vouchers in particular may affect people's health? And two, what evidence, if any, is there about that impact? Let me start with the benefits, the potential benefits of vouchers themselves. I I mean, simply receiving a voucher um, can reduce housing cost burdens. It can increase disposable income alleviate stress and worry about how you're going to pay the rent, and it can uh, reduce overcrowding and protect families from unwanted or forced moves. So that's just the voucher in itself, right? All of all of those, and all of those could turn into to health impacts. Um, and as for mobility programs in particular, um, mobility programs are designed to help families uh, reach neighborhoods that offer greater opportunities for economic mobility. But those neighborhoods are also quieter and safer, which may improve sleep and reduce stress. Those neighborhoods typically have um, less air pollution and fewer environmental hazards. They also have more parks and healthy grocery stores, which may encourage both healthy eating and, and exercise. So all of that, you know, that's so there's lots of theoretical reasons to think that vouchers and mobility vouchers in particular will lead to um, improved health. But, you know, the question is, is, you know, do we actually have empirical evidence that that's true? And 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 I want to start by saying there are tons of studies showing strong association between neighborhood environments and health. Um, but there are many fewer studies that actually show that neighborhood environments affect health, right? That they cause changes in health or improvements in health. And, and the best evidence that we have, um, again, comes from the moving to opportunity demonstration. And, and there, researchers found that about 10 to 15 years after, um, after families received um, their vouchers, uh, adults that were assigned to the group that um, moved to low poverty neighborhoods um, were significantly less likely to have diabetes, were significantly less likely to suffer from extreme obesity, and were significantly less likely to report physical limitations. Um, They also found, the researchers also found improvement in mental health um, among adults. And so those those results were really striking and really significant and I, and i what what's interesting too is that they actually weren't expected or anticipated by the um original sort of the the um the designers of the of the demonstration uh the the focus very much of the demonstration was on employment outcomes and to a lesser degree education outcomes and but it turned out that at least in the short run Researchers didn't find as much impact on um, education and earnings, but they found these significant improvements among adults in in, uh, both physical and mental health. Obviously, the program is not perfect. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about some of the biggest challenges um, that uh, they face and really what are the policy opportunities to to solve those problems. You know, I, I just want to back up and just say like the first key issue is that only about a quarter of, of eligible households um, receive rental assistance, um, which means that demand far exceeds supply in, in most places and the wait for vouchers is very, very long. Um, on average around the country, the wait is about two and a half years, but in uh, in many places, the wait is significantly longer, especially in high cost markets. So that's kind of challenge number one. And 
And um, the second key issue is that even when households receive vouchers, many of them fail to successfully use them. Um, and um, my colleagues, Kathy O'Regan and Sarah Stroshak and I are doing research on, on voucher lease-up rates. Um, and we show that only three in five households that receive a voucher are um, actually use them to rent homes in the allotted time. Okay, so let me just back up and like, re- you know, underscore that, which is that means that two in five voucher households, after waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for this voucher, um, end up having to give back their voucher to the local housing agency. Um, and, and a big part of this is that many vouchers, many landlords, um, simply refuse to, to accept vouchers and, and landlords in high rent neighborhoods, which are often the neighborhoods that offer, um, offer uh, good opportunities for, for economic mobility are especially unlikely to, to accept vouchers. For some, in some cases for landlords, the, the um, their rent that they're charging exceeds the the voucher rent caps, the voucher allowable rent caps, and other landlords simply don't want to deal with the administrative hassles of of working with the local housing agency, and 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 some also bring stereotypes about voucher holders themselves and what kind of tenants they're likely to be. And now you said I could wave a magic wand. Yeah, that's right. I have to say that HUD, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, recently granted one of my wishes. So had we spoken two weeks ago, I would have <laughs> said something different. But but HUD announced that um, that housing agencies in an additional 41 metropolitan areas across the country would be required to use small area FMRs in setting voucher rent ceilings. Okay, that's, that's sort of a mouthful and mm-hmm. probably not understandable to, to many people. But Essentially, that means that um, they're changing sort of where the how how they um, set the voucher rent subsidies, and it, and essentially means that units in every neighborhood now that some units in every neighborhood will be affordable to to voucher holders, not just homes in in the lowest rent neighborhoods. And so, this really can help when you set the subsidy at, at the at the neighborhood level to open up more neighborhoods to voucher hold. I think a second wish would be to amend the Fair Housing Act to ban discrimination based on the source of income that renters use to pay their rent, which would prohibit landlords from refusing to house families simply because they're using a voucher. But I have to say, relatedly, if we were going to adopt such a requirement, then I think we also need to work to improve the voucher program to make it easier for landlords um, to use. Because, you know, some of the concerns that landlords have about the voucher program are completely legitimate. And and I think reforms to the the burdensome inspection process um, are particularly needed. Um, When we talk about helping people move to higher opportunity neighborhoods, um, the other side of that equation, obviously, is that they're leaving lower opportunity neighborhoods. And I know uh, people sometimes ask, what about the legacy residents, those who don't get a voucher, um, those who can't use their vouchers and end up staying in the original neighborhood? Obviously, um, vouchers aren't the only tool policymakers have, and um, we've certainly seen folks trying to boost investment in some of those historically underinvested neighborhoods. But I guess I want to ask you if you see a tension there between programs that help people leave and others which uh, help people um, who stay? So I think we need to do both. Um, there, There is a trade-off only because resources are limited, right? But, but I think the key is to enhance choice. Right? Not every fi- family wants to move to a, a low-poverty neighborhood. And so I think we need to invest in, in Improving the voucher program and ensuring that it lives up to its name, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, um, at the same time that we reinvest in neighborhoods and also our legacy stock of, of aging public housing. Ingrid Allen, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Thanks for inviting me. 
Well, there you have it, folks, my conversation with NYU's Dr. Ingrid Ellen. Tune in next week when we'll talk with UCLA's Dr. Michael Lenz. He's going to help us learn all about low-density zoning and neighborhood segregation. For now, please don't forget to subscribe to Health Affairs This Week, recommend it to a friend, and leave a review. Uh, One more thing, sign up for our newsletters. They're free. They're full of great health policy content that you really won't find anywhere else, and it's the best way to make sure you're among the first to know about our upcoming theme issues like February's Focus on Housing and Health. All right, that'll do it. Talk to you next week, friends. Take care. Mm -hmm.